program officer in the HBS uh, Heinrich Böll Foundation Division for East and Southeast East Europe in Berlin. We are hosting this meeting uh, in this event here from Berlin, but of course, uh, this discussion relates very strongly to our activities in Ukraine. Um, and we prepared this event in close coordination, in particular with my colleague, um, Heinrich Böll Foundation Kiev Office Program Coordinator for um, Energy and Climate Justice, Oksana Lieva, who's present here as well. Um, and I should say that uh, actually the idea to hold uh, this online discussion appeared above all uh, in the exchange in our uh, chats with our friends and partners from the Center for Environmental Initiatives EcoAction, um, because uh, some of the, the recent decisions raised, uh, decisions uh, on, on uh, the energy uh, and electricity market reform in particular, uh, raised our concern about uh, potential delays of necessary steps to redesign the energy sector towards sustainability and decarbonization. And we felt that uh, it is necessary to understand better what is going on here and to share this with uh, reform stakeholders in the European Union. That's why uh, we are holding this discussion this afternoon and I'm uh, glad that you are with us. Thank you for your interest. But before we get deeper into the topic, let me address a few technical issues. Um, First, uh, I want to remind everyone that this discussion will last, will last only one hour. Um, so uh, in the first half, we will listen to the prepared inputs of our invited speakers. And in the second half, uh, the second half is devoted to your questions and comments. And um, because we have a limited time frame, uh, I already now want to ask you to be short and concise in, in your comments. How would it work to contribute from your side uh, to this discussion? Um, most of you are probably already familiar with the Zoom platform and, and uh, how it works. Um, I would ask you to raise the hand, the, the virtual hand in the Zoom function. Um, uh, you see that if you open in the uh, bottom bar of your screen, um, the participants list, and then you, you have the opportunity to uh, press a button for raising hand. And then I will see who wants to contribute a comment or a question. And then, then I can ask you individually to open your microphones uh, to contribute to the discussion. Um, yeah, and it is of course your personal decision uh, whether you want to switch on your video or join in with audio only. Uh, third issue on the uh, technical side, um, for any comments, um, you can also use the chat function here in the Zoom platform uh, during uh, the, the event. Um, but uh, depending on the amount of the chat messages, um, I will hardly, as a moderator, I will hardly be able to relate to, uh, to these chat uh, messages during the discussion. Um, <clears throat> so, um, yeah, that is mainly works for general comments towards the overall audience. Um, we will uh record this event uh please uh be aware of it um and uh, it will be made available afterwards uh, uh, online for those who cannot be with us uh, this afternoon and yeah this is it basically um we have you see it you see him uh, with the help uh, symbol in the list of participants we have our technical host uh, martin with us um, and in case you have any technical issues, you can uh, send a private chat message to him. Um, yeah, now to our topic. Um, usually the international discourse on, uh, on energy with regard to Ukraine would focus on natural gas. Uh, it used to focus on natural gas very much in the, in the past uh, years. Um, in this field, the situation somewhat calmed down uh, since the new transit agreement uh, was concluded in late December. Um, 
now the uh, focus shifted much more to the electricity sector and this sector indeed deserves more attention. Uh, just to name a few facts, um, about half of Ukraine's electricity generated in, is generated in 15 nuclear reactor blocks, uh, but 12 of them have already reached or passed their initial design lifetime of 30 years. Uh, second, um, almost another 40% of the electricity uh, in Ukraine is generated by mostly coal-fired thermal power plants and most of the uh, operating units are more than 40 years old and uh, do not comply with basic environmental and emission standards. Uh, third, the, the energy sector and the main factor are clearly the coal power stations is responsible for more than half of Ukraine's CO2 emissions. Um, and uh, Last but not least, large parts of the energy resources for this electricity generation have to be imported, uh, which undermines the energy security of the country. So it becomes obvious that the development of the electricity sector and the design of the market are absolutely crucial issues. And so we have observed some encouraging de developments indeed. Uh, last year, the installed capacity for renewable electricity generation has rapidly grown. Um, in January, the government has presented its energy transition concept, uh, a strategic vision that clearly aims at uh, committing the country to a path of developing renewables and, and decarbonization, uh, though perhaps not fast enough as, environments, as, as environmentalists might argue. But what is new now about uh, this and uh, yeah, th this is that in the beginning of March, we, had, uh, we have seen a government reshuffling, as uh, you know. Um, however, the Ministry for Energy and Environment, and with it, the whole sector was kind of left in limbo. Uh, the position of the minister remained empty. Until today, we have only an acting minister. Uh, nevertheless, a few critical decisions were already taken on the design of the e electricity market. The, the market position of DTEC, the leading private, private power plant operator owned by major oligarch uh, Rinat Akhmetov was significantly strengthened. Uh, this raises suspicion also because the new prime minister, Schmigal, is a former manager of uh, DTEC. Um, at the end of April, then, the ministry changed the electricity balance planning in favor of coal generation. Um, after all, only this week, the regulatory authority banned the construction of new renewables. Um, the, and the, the energy transition concept is frozen. So enough introduction from my side. Uh, I will now give the floor to our distinguished speakers who will help us to understand what is going on. Um, I will just very briefly introduce them to you in alphabetic order. We have uh, with us Viola Cramon, uh, member of the European Parliament, um, deputy head of the uh, EU-Ukraine committee in the Parliament and uh, member of the Committee for External Relations. Welcome, Viola. Uh, then we have um, uh, Sergei Maslichenko uh, with us, um, former deputy minister for energy and environment, actually even until last week. Um, uh, we have Olena Pavlenko, president of the Dixie Group, uh, one of the leading uh, energy think tanks in Ukraine. Thank you also, Olena, for being with us. We have Oleg Savitsky, board member of the Center for Environmental Initiatives, Eco Action, and independent energy analyst. And last but not least, we have Torsten Wollert, team leader for energy and environment in the U Ukraine support group of the European Commission. Um, yeah, so. Um, we will start with, with Oleg Savitsky. Um, Oleg, um, uh, how do you understand these recent moves by the Ukrainian, by the new Ukrainian government, and uh, why the electricity market question is so central in it? Uh, please, Oleg, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, uh, thank you, Robert, uh, for a very comprehensive introduction and. Uh, yeah, uh, what we see now is uh, very concerning uh, for the civil society, 
both in terms of general uh, governance in, in the environment and that uh, the uh, environment issues they are uh, being put aside uh, in this uh, so-called crisis management mode and uh, we see very negative signs of uh, private capture of uh, state governance basically a power grab uh, both uh, literally and uh, figuratively um, and uh, uh, the government reshuffling uh, brings uh, uh, very like uh, strong uh, control uh, over the electricity sector in the uh, uh, in favor of uh, interests of dominant uh, uh, energy company, DTEC, uh, which also uh, uh, has a monopoly on electricity and exports from Ukraine. And uh, here I would like to illustrate um, with the slides, just a second. Uh, yes. So, uh, as you see here, uh, Ukraine uh, has a I connection. So far, Oleg, sorry. Um, <clears throat> okay. Again, to share your screen now it seems to work better. Yes. Um, yes. Can you? Yeah. Great. Yes. Uh, as you see here, uh, Ukraine's uh, power system uh, is uh, connected to uh, Russia and Belarus, uh, and uh, we operate as a part of the uh, United Energy System inherited from the Soviet Union still. Uh, but a small uh, western part of Ukraine is already synchronized with uh, uh, NSOE, with the European power grid. Uh, and uh, the uh, major uh, generation capacity there is uh, uh, Bushton thermal power plant, which uh, produces over 90% of uh, electricity from coal. Uh, and uh, uh, this is major export uh, facility, which uh, clearly dominates uh, electricity exports from Ukraine. Uh, and uh, another source of electricity exports is uh, Dobrotvir a thermal power plant uh, near to border with Poland. And you see here uh, the special direction. And there is a special line which exports electricity from this uh, power plant to Poland. So basically, all exports of electricity from Ukraine to uh, European Union countries is coal-based. Uh, and uh, uh, those power plants, they would not be able to operate in European countries because uh, of uh, substandard uh, uh, pollution control and uh, very poor efficiency. Uh, the Dobrotvir power plant is actually already 60 years old and uh, its uh, thermal uh, efficiency is well below uh, the any standard in European Union. So uh, the carbon intensity of uh, per kilowatt hour there is very high. So uh, this is just to illustrate what we have uh, in terms of um, electricity experts. And uh, uh, those uh, power plants, they uh, managed by DTEC Zachidenerga, uh, and uh, uh, previously, Denis Schmigal, the current uh, prime minister, was the head of uh, uh, Bushton Thermal Power Plant and also uh, DTEC uh, Zahidenek. Uh, so uh, he was managing the key asset uh, uh, for uh, DTEC. Uh, and uh, uh, here is, you can see this uh, thermal power plant and its uh, ash dump. and uh, uh, just a few weeks ago in April, due to very uh, dry uh, weather uh, uh, in the region, uh, there was a, a dust storm and uh, ash from uh, this uh, 
dump site was covering nearby villages. Uh, and uh, actually this situation is nothing new, but uh, uh, this year it was uh, uh, heavier and the, the more, uh, more uh, exacerbated than in previous years. Um, uh, and uh, also this, this situation is actually not limited to Bushtin, it's just a poster child of Ukrainian thermal power. A uh, similar situation is going on with other thermal power plants. Actually, we have a coal ash dump inside the city in Kiev, and we also have uh, uh, experienced uh, a dust storm also this April, and uh, you can see uh, uh, smokestacks in uh, 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 the background. It's uh, Darniska uh, 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 thermal power plant which is also uh, around 60 years old uh, and uh, this uh, causes uh, the pub public uh, outcry and uh, uh, the uh, new acting minister of energy environment is being criticized that she uh, she uh, is talking about only energy issues and uh, positions herself as a crisis manager uh, but in this, uh, there is a certain degree of uh, cynicism and uh, craftiness uh, because uh, she was working at the ministry for the last five years as the head of uh, directorate of energy markets. And she was responsible for many decisions which formed the current situation in the power sector. And especially in 2016, she signed uh, uh, the uh, so-called uh, Rotterdam Plus uh, scheme, which uh, introduced very beneficial conditions uh, for DTEC. Uh, so, uh, and uh, just uh, a few, just this week, uh, uh, colleagues uh, from uh, Dnipro City, they, uh, the Save Dnipro initiative, they released uh, their uh, analysis investigation. Uh, of uh, 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 thermal power plant and nuclear power plant uh, schedules, which are uh, available from Nuclear Energo uh, official information. And they concluded that uh, uh, nuclear uh, power plants were artificially being uh, uh, switched off and uh, more uh, uh, space uh, for coal power generation uh, occurred uh, even before the uh, official uh, uh, new uh, electricity balance for uh, 2020 was approved. And uh, today we have uh, one of uh, uh, team members from Safety Pro and maybe later he could uh, comment on this. So basically, this is what I had to say, uh, and I uh, give floor to, to you, Robert. Uh, thank you, Oleg, um, <clears throat> for this illustrative uh, uh, contribution. Um, and I would just uh, hand over to uh, Olena Pavlenko um, and uh, to, to comment uh, on uh, what uh, it means uh, from her perspective, having in mind in particular the uh, context of the international obligations uh, of Ukraine uh, in, with, with regard to the uh, obligations in the framework of the association agreement with the European Union and the um, Paris Climate Ag Agreement. And, uh, uh, and how uh, all this fits into it or, uh, or not. Please, Olena. Thank you. Thank you very much, Robert. And thank you very much for the possibility to speak to such uh, honorable audience. So I would like to mention three messages. Uh, the first message is that uh, actually the government cannot decide whether realize or not to realize the international commitments of the country. Uh, Ukraine uh, do has, does have a lot of international commitments uh, to develop renewables, 
to move forward with environmental protection and also uh, to decarbonization. Uh, under the Energy Community Treaty, we have um, up to 10 EU directives related to renewables and environmental issues. Uh, we also have uh, EU directives in the association agreement. Uh, we also signed Paris Agreement. We were one of the first countries. So all of this now should be realized and fulfilled. And the government is not in position to decide whether it will realize or will not realize. It can only propose how to realize uh, those obligations. Moreover, um, talking about uh, the electricity market and what's going on uh, now there, uh, especially with the renewables, I would like to mention that Ukraine also has uh, obligations uh, in front of international investors. So uh, do we want this or not? But uh, we, do, we have to respect uh, what we signed uh, uh, as an agreement with them. Um, many international investors uh, who are from Sweden, Norway, Canada, other countries, uh, some of them uh, took money uh, under the uh, guarantee of international governments. So now uh, it's Ukraine's obligation uh, to uh, respect uh, what it promised to the uh, international investors. So now the government has to find a way to sign a memorandum with uh, uh, international investors uh, to develop our renewable energy sector. My second point is uh, that uh, Probably it's uh, too early to say sharply what's going on uh, in our energy sector now. On the one hand, uh, we do see uh, that the governmental program does have support of renewables. The Article 5 of the government program says that it will support of renewables and development of low carbon sources of energy. But at the same time, uh, I would agree that uh, the concept of uh, Ukraine green energy transition to 2050, which was developed uh, under the low carbon Ukraine project. And uh, there were a lot of discussions and public discussions uh, on how to design it. So we can even say that we have public support of this document. So now this document is frozen. And uh, I think it will be one of the benchmarks whether the government uh, is serious with moving forward with uh, support of renewables, decarbonization, and environmental pr uh, protection or not. So what it will do uh, with this document as a next step. Mm, we also do see some signs to support of coal and uh, do not see the plan of the government how to do the coal phase out. So it would be good to have uh, any information from, from the new minister and the ministry how this phase out call uh, plan will be realized. And uh, one more worried information is that uh, there are some plans to change the environmental impact assessment process during this pandemic situation. And so our position is that uh, environmental impact assessment should be uh, done uh, under the existing legislation with no changes and uh, it should go through the public discussions anyway. So uh, my third message is that uh, now definitely should have more champions in the government uh, which who will uh, promote development of renewables, decarbonization and uh, environmental uh, uh, protection. Uh, it was Ukraine's initiative and Ukraine's will uh, to join the Green Deal. And it was not only the words, but this uh, agreement that we will join the Green Deal was uh, fixed uh, in the uh, Association Council meeting, uh, which uh, actually means that now we have to move forward and uh, discuss how to uh, integrate to the Green Deal agenda of the EU. So uh, before, in the previous government, it was the priority, I would say, of the Vice Prime Minister on European integration, who is 
now the Minister of Foreign Affairs. The existing Vice Prime Minister of European Integration, he's not very active on this. So now the, our task, I think, as a civil society, and uh, we would be also thankful uh, if European partners could join, is to demand and ask government uh, to define the new champion uh, who will lead this process, how Ukraine should be integrated further to the Green Deal agenda, to the uh, initiatives on uh, development of renewables and environmental issues, and how we will realize the concept uh, of green energy transition to 2050. This is all from my side. Uh, we'll be uh, happy to discuss more later. Thank you. Thank you so much, <clears throat> Olena. And uh, we heard already a couple of questions towards our uh, European colleagues, uh, uh, Viola Kramon and Torsten Wöllert. Um, but before uh, they uh, um, will have the floor, I would like to uh, give the word to uh, Sergei Maslichenko. Um, and uh, what, how do you assess, Sergei, the, the uh, freezing of the um, energy transition concept that you yourself uh, de developed and presented uh, only in January? Uh, does that mean uh, that the integration of Ukraine into the Green Deal agenda is uh, threatened or is uh, stopped or uh, what so what's what's the current status um, of it that would be my initial question to you Sergei please yeah thank you Robert. good evening everyone yes indeed it's um, in my view it's an interesting question uh, I would say it's postponed uh, unfortunately we will come there sooner or later for sure but uh, it was great work done together with the public uh, society, civil society, with uh, a lot of experts. And as you know, I see many familiar faces. Many of you participated in the process, uh, which lasted almost five months. We had a number of public events, six public events, when we discussed the concept. We changed it uh, several times. We received 200 comments, actually, uh, uh, for the green energy transition concept which we incorporated most most of them and uh, just to update you on the uh, current status uh, we also done a great work uh, you know uh, working with other ministries and agencies to collect their feedbacks and endorsements so and the whole package was uh, prepared actually was a uh, week ago and uh, was actually my last day in the office and uh, submitted for acting minister's uh, kind of signature and I signed it off uh, as well as uh, all relevant uh, ministry uh, colleagues but as far as I know from uh, my former colleagues uh, it was rejected and sent for additional uh, conceptual kind of uh, work so uh, the status is unclear and uh, this is quite worrying, but I also wouldn't be too strong and dramatic uh, saying that, uh, you know, it's end story. I, I think in Ukraine we have a strong uh, civil society, we also have strong European support and uh, this Green Deal, European Green Deal is a good angle to push and tackle the issue. And uh, yeah, we see of obviously negative developments uh, nowadays, but uh, I think in the medium term, uh, the, uh, the situation will improve. Uh, as regards uh, my departure also, I, I think it was also a strong sign and, you know, I wanted uh, to stay and wanted to deliver, obviously, but as I'm a result oriented, person and uh, wanted to see uh, results and of course cooperation uh, it's uh, for me was uh, quite uh, I po posted in on Facebook and LinkedIn recently a short article uh, about uh, the decision about my experience it was uh, unfortunately a new government who didn't share this green uh, concept as you rightly mentioned already uh, my, uh, Alec and Robert uh, 
uh, environmental issues are not a first priority uh, for the current uh, government and for, it was actually missing and was heavily criticized by environmental uh, parliamentary committee that the current governmental program. And uh, also to come back to Elena's remark on renewable energy and low carbon uh, sources in the program, they appeared due to our kind of uh, uh, three times lobby and request. So it was not in the initial draft. So, and then we come back with the proposals uh, to incorporate energy efficiency, incorporate renewable energy and green energy transition, uh, in, at least in brackets. So it was rejected, but at least renewable energy as a word uh, definition was in, put inside the program. As you know, it's a very short program. Uh, more will come as action plan, as I understand. And uh, uh, I mean, the word climate, I think climate adaptation was also inserted due to uh, uh, the old previous team uh, uh, of the ministry efforts. But so we have what we have. But I think uh, another issue I wanted to highlight is uh, uh, minister's institution is very weak uh, at the moment because, as you know, uh, two ministries uh, started uh, emerging half a year ago and this cabinet dismissal uh, caught us in the middle of the process, actually. So the reorganization was not completed. New staff, uh, people, uh, specialists uh, were in the process of, you know, uh, competitive tender for hiring was also frozen due to um, COVID, unfortunately. So, and now a new team is coming and they also, I understand, trying to rearrange, uh, reorganize the structure. So, uh, situation is, uh, from institutional point of view, is quite difficult and there are a lot of issues uh, which has to be tackled. Uh, you know, uh, don't have any dedicated attention, unfortunately. I think uh, it's enough from my side. So happy to answer any questions, if any. Yeah, th thank you very much, <coughs> Sergi. Um, then uh, uh, I would like to hand over to uh, Torsten Wollert. Um, Torsten, how do you uh, assess uh, these recent uh, developments, and uh, uh, how? Uh, can the how is the uh, European Green Deal translated into the uh, cooperation with Ukraine from from your side? Uh, and um, yeah, um, uh, do you see already new champions for the Green Deal agenda in in Ukraine uh, on on the side of the, the uh, partners you are uh, in touch with? Uh, thank you. Please. Yeah, thank you very much uh, for organizing this video conference, uh, which I think is a pretty useful experience also because it allows to share views and information. Uh, so even when we are all out of confinement, maybe this is an experience that we can also have more regularly. Uh, what we are seeing now, especially uh, when we are working all remotely, is a lot of smoke and uh, it is not yet fully clear what will appear out of the smoke. Uh, it is clear that there is a profound uh, instability in uh, not only uh, the energy system but also in the governance system with a very, I mean with no fully fledged energy minister for more than two months now, uh, is the second acting minister now changing the teams, uh, Nobody knows how long these teams will be able to work. Uh, so that is a pretty strong factor also of uh, concern. And uh, what we are seeing now is that it, everything is short term. Uh, everybody is focusing, um, as Oleg also said, on the crisis management mode, uh, which prevents a systemic work. And this is exactly what we are trying to do. I mean, the EU and Ukraine, we try to uh, step by step go ahead with a systemic and structural energy partnership. And we see the results in some areas, for instance, on the gas side, we have worked on this, uh, and you mentioned this, uh, we started with that for the last five years, and now the situation is much better than it was five years ago. On electricity, uh, it was more difficult. We started later, and also the, the law 
which regulates the sector has been adopted uh, much later. And now there are a lot of really serious implementation issues uh, which are leading to uh, non-paid bills, uh, monopoly structures, uh, ignoration of, uh, of some rules uh, and uh, also some technical decisions which are not really helpful. Um, and what we are trying to focus on is to ensure that the systemic cooperation, which is about European Green, which is about integrating our energy systems, uh, will go ahead uh, when the smoke disappears. Uh, we are also, I'm relatively confident that we will see some sort of compromise on renewable energy. Uh, it was clear already one and a half years ago that uh, the system as it was designed then uh, would not be sustainable. So we supported Ukraine together with other partners like the EBRD to develop uh, a system which is more in line with best European practices, including auctions for, en uh, for renewable energy. Uh, and unfortunately, what we had seen already uh, some time ago has now uh, materialized that you have a big rush, as we also had in other countries, huh? including in Germany. Uh, we had a big rush to, uh, to complete projects under certain conditions because uh, it was clear that the cost is going down and the feed and health is not going down as fast as the cost. So uh, it became more and more uh, interesting uh, and profitable. Uh, we have a couple of tools and uh, Olena mentioned some of them. Uh, to engage in the systemic cooperation. Uh, we also have the association agreement where we have just updated the energy annex and we are now in the process of updating the annexes for climate and for environment. Uh, and that is so also something especially uh, on climate which is of course linked to Green Deal and energy transformation and uh, where the ministry uh, is uh, in charge and we very much hope that this process, no matter crisis mode or not, will continue. Uh, and we are also involved in some more mid and long term structural issues, uh, which are also linked to this uh, Green Deal and transformation processes. One is uh, the transformation of the coal mining regions, because they have a structural problem. There's a lot of experience uh, in different EU countries. Uh, the uh, the people on the ground, the mayors, uh, they know that they have to diversify their economy and we are ready to help together with other partners like uh, the World Bank, Germany, etc. Uh, and we hope that the work that has started on, on this topic will continue. And there it is interesting to see that uh, we have now, we are now in discussions that a dedicated office may be established uh, under the uh, cabinet of ministers or the prime minister's office uh, to steer this process. Uh, and these are signs which allow us to be, well, cautiously optimistic or pessimistic, however you want to look at this, uh, that we come out with some structural solutions when the smoke uh, disappears. We have not yet seen a fundamental change of strategy which would essentially go back to uh, manual uh, management of the whole sector, uh, blocking outsiders, etc. There's a risk, but we have not yet seen it and we of course very much hope that it will not materialize and we will certainly be part of the process to uh, make the structural changes work. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Torsten Wörlert. Uh, please allow me one uh, short uh, question back to you. Uh, uh, Oleg Zawitsky mentioned the high carbon intensity of the electricity exports from Ukraine to the e European Union. And uh, in uh, the initial plans for the European Green Deal, there was uh, the idea on the table of in, uh, introducing carbon border tax or carbon border uh, adjustment uh, uh, mechanisms. Can you briefly comment on, uh, on that? Is, will that be on a longer term perspective, of course? Uh, uh, can that be a relevant uh, tool to a relevant incentive um, to 
to impact to to influence on the uh, uh, development of the electricity generation in Ukraine. Well, that's an interesting question. We just discussed it also, uh, I think, in February uh, with Sergei, uh, and the uh, this carbon border adjustment mechanism is now being designed, developed uh, for the European Union. And uh, already in the basic design, uh, we have uh, started to involve Ukraine. So we had some, some talks uh, and we wanted to discuss this in March, April in Brussels at expert level. The aim is very clear. Uh, we want uh, that the Ukrainian energy system or the Ukrainian production system, which is not only energy, uh, becomes, let's say, carbon friendly, which be it becomes compatible to the European market so that uh, the carbon border adjustment mechanism would not apply necessarily to producers from Ukraine. That's the long term aim. And then we were discussing several options, but it's very early days on both sides to, to talk about the options. Uh, except among, among experts uh, in a sort of uh, brainstorming mode. Uh, but it is clear that our ambition should be on both sides to find a mechanism which allows the Ukrainian producers to participate in the European uh, Union markets, not being subject to this border adjustment mechanism. Uh, and there are several options. Uh, and uh, we also have time to discuss this because it is just developing policy uh, in the EU. Uh, and I very much hope that Ukraine will continue to engage on this very important topic because it is part of the whole modernization program for Ukraine. And uh, especially if Ukraine wants to have future oriented investments, that should be part of it uh, after the Corona crisis. Okay, yeah, thank you for, for this comment as well. Um, directly over to Viola. Um, what, uh, how uh, Viola is, is uh, uh, for a long time already uh, thoroughly ob observing uh, what's going on in Ukraine. Um, what is your assessment um, of uh, the, the uh, new developments in the in the energy sector by the new uh, um, Ukrainian government and? Uh, does it uh, play already a, a role also in the uh, uh, talks in the European Parliament, in, in the committees about how to design, for example, the Eastern Partnership Initiative uh, to, to include um, uh, efforts to support decarbonization of the uh, Eastern Partnership, Eastern neighborhood countries, in particular Ukraine? Thank you, uh, Robert. Thanks to the Heinrich Böll uh, Foundation to organize this lovely panel and thanks to all the speakers for the valuable inputs so far. Uh, well, since uh, you have mentioned I am in Ukraine uh, since 96 and I remember perfectly in 96 uh, debates with World Bank exactly about the same topics we are in now. So for almost 25 years, there was not too much uh, progress, even Thorsten Wallet had said we are a little bit uh, better in terms of gas supply. Yes, that's for sure. A lot of money flew into the country and we had at some points definitely, uh, let's say, a little bit more forward and progressive uh, ministries, but definitely not enough. And there's always a big reluctance, especially in the parliament. We have always a heavy lobby against any kind of, let's say, more progressive, decentralized, uh, less carbon intensive um, uh, intensive energy supply. And, and some of the reasons are being mentioned uh, by, by some of the speakers. Of course, it is a regional problem, it's a structural problem, it's a political problem. But nevertheless, coming uh, as a politician and observing the situation in Ukraine, let me at least um, uh, make some remarks uh, that I see the oligarchy is, is, is really pushing back uh, in the person of, of Mr. Kolomoisky and with having a head of the committee, uh, Mr. Geros, who obviously is completely in line with uh, the anti-renewable uh, um, uh, league or anti-renewable uh, alliance in Ukraine and very uh, 
uh, closely linked uh, to the fossil fuel energy, I guess it will be much, much harder for the next weeks and for the next um, upcoming month um, to negotiate about a real strategy towards more renewables, towards a real green deal um, being um, uh, or kind of, of um, um, connected to uh, the draft of the Green New Deal or European deal uh, in the European Union. Um, I would like uh, to see a, a very strict regime when it comes to, um, let's say, uh, the, the current adjustment uh, tax, which were being mentioned by, by Mr. Wollett, and also I would even like to see the uh, macro finance uh, assistance, uh, which will be paid uh, or is already paid in, in some tranches. And um, uh, I think Olena has mentioned this. Uh, there is a lot of obligation uh, being um, signed by different uh, by by different international treaties. So there should be enough obligations uh, to finally. Um, uh, um, uh, verpflichten to finally uh, demand uh, from the new government a more uh, ambitious uh, energy uh, uh, draft law, or no, uh, energy renewable uh, draft law than what we have seen for the, for the last uh, weeks. Um, uh, I understand that the vacuum and the lack of the ministry and the weak uh, minister's institution, what we have seen for the last weeks, is one of the key, let's say, obstacles. But nevertheless, what I have experienced from different angles, uh, the heavy power and the heavy lobbying of Kolomoisky and his people against any kind of more progressive uh, decentralized law, uh, is of big concern, at least in, 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 in those uh, committees I've spoken to some MEPs. Um, we, will, we will see, uh, so far I do not see, let's say, a comprehensive approach from the, from the Ukrainian side. There are bits and pieces and it's not really a vision, it's not a concept, it's not a strategy which was being rolled out. It's more a pushback and, and, and um, a big reluctance uh, towards a real green agenda. Um, whether this could be changed or whether the influence and the, the pressure coming from the European Union, from the uh, advisory group and also from our a delegation or from the commission uh, would be uh, sufficient to really change this agenda. I, I really cannot say at this at this point. Um, I have to say we are too far away. Uh, but what I've heard are very alarming and very um, uh, concerning um, messages uh, from Kiev and and from the political. Uh, sphere in in general, and I mean, I'm I'm happy to to listen. But what uh, Robert you have mentioned at the beginning, I mean, the entire infrastructure in the energy sector is so old. And uh, as far as I was aware of, there went I mean, in this energy sector, um, I don't know how many millions were invested from uh, the international community, but for me, this is really a missed opportunity. So the last 25 years are not being used for really uh, um, renewables or decentralized or any kind of energy efficient uh, uh, supplies. Um, and, and also when it comes to, let's say, uh, renewable production, uh, the Chinese, they have quickly picked up uh, our idea of feed and tariffs, and they have built up their own uh, industry in terms of solar and wind and geothermic uh, uh, production. And Ukraine has a big industrial sector. They have great engineers, they have great uh, universities, they have a big uh, tradition in, in, in terms of um, energy uh, equipment uh, production. But there's nothing, nothing has been produced in, in Ukraine or almost nothing. I heard there's one big producer, okay. But of course, then you rely on, on imports and when you 
um, have, uh, I mean, when you have to take uh, investments and you think about the opportunity cost, you rather rely on the old infrastructure than going for highly or pretty highly costly a new investment. But this is, I guess, a lot of um, uh, past management uh, mistakes and um, now I guess the new government will pay a lot uh, for modernizing um, for modernizing the energy infrastructure uh, during oh, um, yeah during the next uh, years this would be my assessment okay thank you viola <clears throat> so now our time management is not working so well as as I uh, uh, have planned it so but still uh, let's uh, open the round for uh, comments and, and questions and I already see two hands and uh, uh, I would like to uh, give first the word to Alina Swiderska from the uh, Clean Energy Lab uh, because uh, she, uh, she will perhaps have so some uh, interesting comments on uh, the renewable sector uh, knowing very well what's happening there. Uh, Thorsten Wöllert was uh, uh, cautiously optimistic. How is it uh, for, for you, uh, Alina? Uh, yes, hello everyone. I also represent the uh, European Ukrainian Renewable Energy Association. Um, and we work closely with the foreign investors who came to the country. And I think that uh, since 2017, um, most of the FDIs came from the renewable energy. And so far, uh, we have uh, approximately 30% of the green energy uh, producers from international investors. And in total, that takes 2.5 billion euros. And uh, it's quite significant numbers. And uh, it was really difficult to build trust and to bring foreign investors into the country after the revolution. And um, we all understand that there are market problems right now. And Ukraine is in this energy transition mode when we have more greens on the grid and then the government needs to understand what to do with this energy mix, what to do with nuclear, what to do with coal, and what to do with growing number of uh, rests on the market. And of course, the government should have done lots of job, like uh, introducing more manuring capacities, uh, creating storage opportunities, and not, lots of things has, haven't been done for years. And now we see that uh, the government since last October is blaming uh, mostly green energy in all the problems. And uh, by doing that, they're saying there is a need to uh, significantly reduce um, feed-in tariffs and uh, cut projects which are under construction. And this is probably part of the solution and part of the industry agreed for the restraints. That's why there was a, actually there is still a mediation uh, managed by the European um, Energy Commission. And uh, we're looking forward to the uh, compromised solution with the government, which will take into account the uh, restraints which business is ready to go for. Uh, but it would be completely a big disaster and disappointment, I mean, for, for, for the country and for me as a citizen, if all those 2.4, 2.5 billion investors who came to country would be killed uh, because of the need to solve the problem. And we all know that a solution of uh, the whole energy electricity crisis lies not only in green energy. It's like a whole complex bunch of problems which needs to be done. And of course, we would need more investments into modernizing the grid, into having manuring capacities. And we need this trust. We need the trust of investors, of the lenders. I think EBRD itself invested only 600 billion Euro, uh, million uh, euros uh, in Ukraine. So this is my short comment. Thank you, uh, Alina Svidaska. Next one is uh, Alex Mikhailenko. Uh, yep, thank you. Um, hi, my name is Alex. I am a part of Low Carbon Ukraine project, and Gil Sakman is sending his regards. Um, I will talk a bit about the economics of the size, so about the electricity market. Um, the, the point is, is that we've discussed previously uh, was about the uh, need to modernize the system and to integrate more renewables and the uh, liberalization of the electricity market is, is a paramount uh, part in here. Uh, in order to really increase the share of renewables and to integrate it quickly and at least cost, you need a properly working market. And this is not what's happening now in Ukraine. We see that uh, more and more administrative control is now um, is now the fixed idea of the government. 
And the main problem, which is the lack of competition, is not addressed at all. Uh, more to that, the government uh, has not done anything in the past nine months to remedy the situation. They only shifted money uh, from one agent to another, but they didn't, um, they didn't decide the competition. They didn't help the market to grow. The other problem for renewables is also that they are now um, the whole uh, output is uh, sold to one of taker. So basically, renewables are not part of the uh, market. They are not an active participant. Uh, but this is what's uh, also important for renewables to be a key player, uh, independent player, is to give them opportunity for direct marketing and uh, receive support, not only uh, to, by selling to uh, governmental uh, single of taker. Other problem with the market uh, is the household prices and the, uh, they are subsidized, heavily subsidized in Ukraine and the latest government decision basically mixed the subsidization of household prices with renewable support and it's now getting a, the uh, problems that shouldn't be mixed up, they are now a big uh, problem and it's, uh, it's become a political problem more than economical problem and that's another um, and as a uh, blowback to, to the development of the market. So basically, uh, what you really need to integrate renewables apart from political side is to have an effective market that uh, uh, incentivizes competition and the pricing uh, mechanisms that shows the real situation in the market. And the current market is Ukraine is not showing any, um, any signal for potential investors. And we're not talking not only about renewables, but other investors that could bring uh, new technologies, flexibility options to the grid. And with uh, low competition, price caps on uh, uh, most, most of the market segments, there is no room for new investment. The only way for new investments apart from renewables is the mechanism for governmental support, which is planned by the ministry to be uh, used this year. Uh, but we know that uh, the process for the, uh, the competition, the rules for that auction is not perfect and they may not incentivize the most efficient and uh, low carbon uh, flexibility options. So there are a lot of things that are um, not helping the market to work, but they are, can be fixed. They can be fixed uh, even this year, but the strategic problems, the structural problems of the market, which is the lack of competition and uh, uh, this administrative, uh, significant administrative control, basically trying to run the liberalized market in the old ways uh, in times of administrative control is the biggest barriers, uh, not only for renewables, but for the whole uh, system. Uh, again, as to political side of that, we don't see also, we don't see a lot of will of the new government, but uh, let's uh, wait and see uh, for the new ministry team. I know they've, um, the now new deputy minister to Ministry of uh, Energy and Environmental Protection, Yuri Boyko, he has a significant um, experience in the market and he understands the, uh, how the market works a lot. But uh, again, it's quite early to say what will be the next uh, most in Ukraine. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you. And <clears throat> I see one more hand and uh, uh, I, uh, I will give floor to, to this hand, uh, Pavel Kachchenko in, in a minute. And uh, then we will have a very short, brief uh, closing round with our uh, uh, initial speakers. Um, because our time is running out. We, we will extend by uh, five to seven minutes, but uh, yeah, so Pavel Kachenko, you are the next one. Please unmute yourself. Thank you so much. I will be very fast, so nice to meet you. Thank you for the introduction. Thank you for inviting to the meeting. We are a small group, Save Dnipro, from city of Dnipro in Ukraine. And uh, a few days ago, we did the analyze of the dynamics uh, of coal and nuclear generation in Ukraine's power grid uh, in the past uh, two months. And it looks like Ukraine is taking a year turn from its planned uh, green uh, energy transition. Uh, nuclear power plants uh, are stopped in the favor of a coal generation, and uh, which is the most polluting uh, industry. And 80% of the coal generation is owned by the tech company. And on top of that, 
it's, it was done quietly almost two months before the official announcement of the new plan. And uh, this loopsidized the decision in dangerous in three respects, environmental, euro, integrational, and epidemiological. Uh, because such operation practices are especially dangerous when viral respiratory infections uh, spread, such as COVID-19. And also the, the bottom line, we see also the issue that uh, the single ministry, which uh, we have right now in Ukraine, will always have the conflict of interests uh, and between environmental and the energy generation. And uh, as we see right now, the last two months that we, they give the priority to the energy and uh, hiding all the issues with the environment. Okay. But thanks so much. Thank you. And then I would say we have the last uh, comments from our initial speakers in the, uh, in the vice versa order. So uh, Viola, would you like to start? Uh, but please very short and concise in, in case you have something to add and to comment. Uh, I think it was important what Alina has mentioned with the foreign direct investment and uh, this uh, to keep in mind also for the current government is, is crucial when you know that uh, the highest amount uh, of money comes uh, for, for foreign direct investment comes from the renewable uh, sector that uh, says something and I hope I mean maybe not because of emission reason maybe not because of health reason even I think this would be more important but this should be convincing to the government and I'm happy to whenever we can travel uh, talk to some of uh, my colleagues in the uh, um, committee for energy and so on so this is I guess a very convincing argument thank you okay thank you Viola uh... Austin Villard, what would be your conclusion? Conclusion? Oh, there is no conclusion, just a suggestion. I think one of the problems why we are discussing in Ukraine renewables controversially is that the concept of renewables in Ukraine is still very old fashioned. Renewables in many countries uh, is distributed as decentral. Uh, it can be owned by anyone. In Ukraine, it is big, it is centralized, and uh, it is owned by a few ones, a few internationals and a few nationals. And I think what would really be important after all this smoke uh, disappears is to try to help Ukraine integrate the, the notion that renewables is a local solution to increase the local energy security and to locally find, uh, fight energy poverty. Because so far, what has happened, a huge solar power plant re should replace or compete with a huge coal-fired power plant. And interestingly, the biggest investor in uh, renewables is the same as the biggest owner of coal-fired power plants and coal mines. And this is, uh, let's say, uh, legacy of an old Soviet system where everything has been centralized. So I think that would be a real step forward uh, for the energy transition. Uh, thank you, Torsten Wöllert. Uh, last comment from Sergei Maslichenko's side. Maybe you can briefly comment on, on this uh, difficulty with the competition, with this centralization and monopolization. Uh, to what extent would you say, Sergei, that uh, the uh, tech is so system critical that, that so many people are uh, as uh, so many uh, efforts are done to, to protect uh, the, this monopoly, uh, whatever it takes. Yes, thank you. Uh, also, before going to that, on uh, Torsten comment on renewables, it's also important uh, to acknowledge that in Ukraine, uh, renewables is all about electricity, but like in European countries, a huge share is, uh, you know, heat production. And this is where I think uh, Ukraine also lost uh, in the past focus. And I think uh, this area when, you know, uh, these heating companies consume lots of natural gas. Uh, is uh, overlooked and you know should be addressed, but this is related to another big district heating reform, which is also uh, not going forward at all. And uh, yeah, 
In terms of uh, monopolistic character of the energy sector, that's clear, I think, and uh, this uh, huge, uh, if not the main constraint of the uh, electricity market development. And unless it's uh, issue resolves, the, we will have this, uh, you know, uh, problems. And also to conclude, I wanted to say that uh, indeed, it's not a, a tragedy, right? We just see the first steps, which are quite worrying, yeah, but I hope, and I think this is my advice uh, for civil society, for European Union and other donors uh, to voice the message and all together, I think we can change uh, uh, the way forward for Ukraine. Thank you for this uh, optimistic note. Uh, uh, Olena, what would be your conclusion? Yes, I was listening uh, very carefully, also all participants and speakers. So for me, I, I, would, uh, I would propose three pillars uh, for the government or for all of us, uh, what should save the situation. The first one is, uh, Definitely the political will to move forward with uh, Green Deal agenda. Uh, the second one is uh, to respect all commitments and fulfill all obligations um, as a, as to, to the European Union and to international investors. And the third one is um, um, to further liberalize the market. So we definitely should uh, uh, further work on reforms on electricity market of Ukraine. Thank you. Thank you, Olena. And uh, last not least, uh, uh, Alex Zavitsky. Uh, what, uh, what is your conclusion? Yeah, I would like to, in conclusion to reflect on the just transition uh, concept uh, for Ukraine and uh, the need for uh, organized uh, uh, exit from the coal industry and the uh, structured approach to heavy industry. And uh, I think uh, we will not be able to solve structural problems without some very big political shifts uh, also in terms of uh, uh, attitude from European countries towards Ukraine and especially European private capital to Ukraine and to stop the extractive attitude uh, towards Ukraine, which uh, basically laid the foundation for monopolization of uh, uh, Ukraine's power sector. And uh, uh, I mentioned this is in my briefing uh, and which is available for all the participants. So we had uh, huge investments uh, from uh, European private banks coming into DTEC and uh, they continue and uh, uh, now we have this situation with the big uh, like pressure uh, on the government from DTEC to introduce some beneficial conditions also because DTEC has uh, loans in European banks and uh, DTEC has uh, uh, also uh, in April ent entered a default uh, on uh, these loans uh, and uh, this shows uh, how unsustainable is uh, uh, financing of the uh, energy sector from uh, European uh, private banks. Uh, and uh, I think uh, that uh, to have some real uh, just transition and uh, Green Deal for Ukraine, we need to uh, uh, change this uh, colonial attitude. It's really a, a colonial, neo-colonial attitude uh, towards Ukraine. And I think this is the major problem uh, uh, which materializes every uh occasion for for last uh, uh, three decades uh, in in ukraine uh and uh, i think what we have now is also very dangerous in terms of what is happening with uh, uh, energotum the nuclear uh, uh, operator which is losing its uh, 
uh, professional uh, uh, workers, uh, its technical competence, and its uh, even safety of operations because it's been put in uh, conditions uh, where there is no eff effective management and where is no uh, strategy for uh, development of the company and eventually for decommissioning of nuclear uh, units. Uh, so uh, I think what we have uh, uh, when uh, the government is uh, like sacrificing uh, the state-owned generation in, in favor of private is very dangerous and, and can lead to uh, uh, dire consequences. Uh, which can be unexpected. Okay, yeah, thank you, uh, Oleg, for uh, adding these aspects that are uh, for sure particularly important as, as well. So um, uh, our time is, is over, unfortunately. Um, uh, I thank you, everyone, uh, for participating. Uh, uh, there's one, one more comment from Torsten Vellat. Yes, I wanted to thank you for organizing this, and I wanted to encourage you not to leave it with this one single one, because I think this is an ongoing subject. And I think it would be good to have this more or less regularly, I don't know, once a month or something, especially because the format, if we do it in this kind of video format, I hope we will all still, when we are no longer in confinement, be ready to participate in, in these kind of debates. I think it's very useful. Okay, yeah, thank you for, for this suggestion. Um, yeah, I hope that uh, <clears throat> everyone uh, could benefit from from this mutual update on assessments and and uh, positions and and facts uh, what what's going on um, particular thanks goes of course to our uh, speakers thank you for preparing your your inputs and, and sharing your uh, views and assessments with us um, I wish everyone a, a, a good evening uh, and um, yeah uh, we we will uh, inform you about uh, coming similar events and publications. Um, thank you for being with us this afternoon. Yeah, okay, goodbye. Yeah, thank you. Bye.